Hi, I'm Rod Bryant, and thank you for uh, joining us for another class. Today we're going to be talking about Noahide identity. This is going to be the first in a series of lessons that are addressing Noahide identity. Now, look, um, I, I know what it's like to leave your previous religious identity that was very, very defined in uh, a particular denomination or, or religious structure to come to toward Judaism for the non-Jew to find out that you don't, quote, have an identity. Well, not really the case, but it seems. You're not a Jew, so what are you? And, and then you, you feel like, well, if I tell somebody I'm a Noahide, well, what is a Noahide? I mean, I have no clue what a Noahide is. Well, I'm going to even more, I'm going to th thicken the plot even more. No one knows what a Ger is or a Ger Toshav unless you are uh, a practicing Orthodox Jew or a Jew in, in particular. So today, we're going to be talking about Noahide identity. This is going to be the first and several discussions about the different types of gear or the different types of Noahide. The most important question to answer before getting to the practical observance of Noahide laws is this. What is a Noahide? It is deceptively simple question because it in involves a very complicated answer an answer vital to the practical fun, fun, fulfillment of the Noahide laws. In the next few lessons, we'll examine the question in great depth. It involves the study of many apparently unrelated topics and a vast array of sources in order to get to our conclusion. Note, much of the material in this and the next two lessons will be advanced, and if you have questions, uh, after the class, make sure that you take and add a comment in the comment section on this video, and I'll get back with you and answer it quickly. Let's discuss the Ger Toshav question. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 2, God commands the Jewish people, states, When the Lord your God shall bring you into the land, when you go to possess it, and shall cast out many nations before you, the Hittite, the Ger Shanites, uh, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God shall deliver them up before you, you shall smite them. You shall completely destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show them favor. From this last verse, nor show them favor, the Talmud of Odazara 20a derives a number of prohibitions, one of which is a prohibition of settling idolaters in the land of Israel. Maimonides proposes Exodus 23.33 as the reason for these injunctions. They, quote, the idolater, shall not dwell in your land, lest they cause you to sin against me and worship other gods. Maimonides also summarizes the halakha practice derived by the Talmud from these verses. It is forbidden to sell them homes in the field in Israel. In Syria, one may sell them homes, but not fields. One may rent them homes in Israel, providing that the neighborhood of idolaters is not established. Fewer than three homes, according to Talmudic law, does not constitute a neighborhood. It is, however, forbidden to rent them fields. In Syria, one may rent them fields. It is permitted to sell them houses and fields in diaspora or in uh, exile because it is not our land. The land of Israel is the land of the Jews. Even when it is permitted to rent houses to idolaters, it is not permitted to rent them for the use as a dwelling because they will bring idols into them. As Deuteronomy tw uh, 726 states, do not bring an abomination into your home. It is, however, permitted to rent them homes to use as storehouses. It is forbidden to sell them fruit, grain, or any produce while it is attached to the earth. One may sell them after they have been harvested or on a condition that they will be harvested and then he must harvest them. Why is it forbidden to sell them land or anything attached to the land? Because the Torah states in uh, chapter 7 of Deuteronomy verse 2, don't show them favor, which the Talmud points out also reads as, don't give them a resting place in the land. As long as they do not have a resting place in the land, their stay will be temporary one. It is forbidden to give an idolater a present. The Shulchan Aru, 
and all codifiers, codifiers rule in the agreement with Maimonides that it is prohibited for idolaters to settle permanently in Israel. The rule, however, only applies when Israel has sovereignty and authority over the non-Jews in the land. Maimonides' last statement regarding gifts is curious on the account of the following verse, Deuteronomy 14.21. I already knew that you were thinking this. You shall not eat improperly slaughtered meat. You shall give it to the gear within your gates so that it may he may eat it. Now, this verse instructs the Jew to gift improperly slaughtered meat to a gear. Now, we might assume that this gear within your gates is a convert to Judaism, because if he was a convert, well, clearly it would be a violation of Torah law, because a person who was a Jew or a convert to Judaism could not eat treif meat, or meat that was not quite 100% kosher. However, this cannot be because a convert is like a born Jew in his obligation to observance, the dietary laws, etc. If, however, this verse speaks of non-Jew, then it must refer to a unique non-Jew, one who is not an idolater. Otherwise, how is the Jew allowed to gift the meat to a non-Jew? As we must just learn, a Jew may not favor an idolater with gifts. From this verse and many others, we see that the Torah anticipates the presence of non-idolatrous Gentiles in Israel referring to such an individual as a ger tosha. Now it's becoming more clear. Exodus 12, 43 through 45. This is the decree of the Passover. A resident toshav and a hired laborer may not eat of it. How about Leviticus 25, 6? The land's yield of the sabbatical year shall be yours to eat, yours and the resident toshav who sojourns, ger, ger toshav, among you. Leviticus 25, 35, you shall strengthen him, the convert or the resident toshav. Leviticus 25, 40, like a laborer or a resident toshav, he shall be with you until the jubilee year, he shall work with you. Leviticus 25, 45, also from among the children of the residents, toshav, who dwell, ger, with you. Are you getting the point now? Leviticus 25, 47. If the means of a sojourner, Ger, who resides as Toshav among you. How about Numbers 35, 15? We're going to be exhaustive here. But the children of Israel, the convert and the resident Toshav among them. Now, the term Ger from the Hebrew root Gar, meaning to sojourn, refers to an alien or a stranger who is an immigrant. Toshav means resident, or one who resides. A ger toshav is therefore a resident alien, a non-Jew who resides in the land of Israel among the Jewish people. A survey of the Midrashic, uh, Mishnaic, Talmudic, and Halakhic literature reveals that a ger toshav, though not Jewish, enjoys many of the benefits reserved for the Jews who live in the land of Israel. However, the Ger Toshav is also bound by many of the same restrictions that apply to idolaters. Let's examine the residency of a Ger Toshav. Unlike an idolater, the Ger Toshav is allowed to settle even permanently in the land of Israel. However, his dwelling there is subject to a number of conditions. Let's go over them. The Ger Toshav must be settled in a place where he can make a living and practice his trade. Ager Toshav was not permitted to live near the borders of Israel, but only well into the interiors. This has to do with security. A Jew may sell land to, in Israel to a Ger Toshav, not an idolater. Once settled, the Jews may not force a Ger Toshav to move from his place to another. It is, however, permitted to relocate him if the move is substantial benefit to him. A ger toshav may not re reside in Jerusalem. Remember that Jerusalem was initially set up for a dwelling place for the priesthood uh, alone. The Jewish community is commanded with a general obligation derived from Leviticus 25.35 to sustain a ger toshav. Such is not the case for an idolater. The Jewish community is prohibited from providing medical treatment or even saving a life of an idolater. I know this seems 
quite strenuous and and uh, almost maybe ridiculous to a postmodern era. But in the time that these laws were laid out, a, a, an idolater was a very uh, horrible person. Uh, they offered their children to mullah. They sacrificed their children. They participated in rituals uh, of, of sinful decadence. And therefore, uh, God was clear not to entertain them in any way. Now let's talk about sustaining a ger toshav and what it includes. The Jews commanded to su sustain the ger toshav and uh, ensure his welfare in the same way that they would their fellow Jew. For example, if he is in danger, he must do whatever possible to save his life. So too, he must support with charity. Since Jews are commanded to ensure his welfare, they may even provide a ger toshav with free medical care if necessary. A Jew may even on Shabbos assist a ger toshav in giving birth. An eye-opener probably to some of you rabbis who are taking this course. Jews may give gifts to the ger toshav. Jews may go beyond the minimal social uh, graces required for peace when interacting with a ger toshav. This is not the case with an idolater, for whom we may only show the minimal degree of courtesy needed to maintain peace and civility. A ger toshav though, may be treated with the same etiquette and kindness and grace afforded to other Jews. I realize that over the last uh, 100 years or more, that it has been difficult for Jews who have gone through so much persecution to not just lump every goy as an idolater. And I understand the, the philosophy that says that, well, what do you assume? I think that you should assume right off the bat that there are idolaters. Well, my beloved rabbis and Torah students who are Jews, let me encourage you with these words. There are many hundreds of pious non-Jews who are enjoining themselves with Torah-based study and with Orthodox rabbis around the world. And we're asking you to only just fulfill what the scripture asks you to do as priests to the nations. And that is to be kind to the ger. Now, we don't have Ger Toshav today, per se, because we don't have a legal uh, system that is set up according to Torah law, and we don't have a Sanhedrin, and the temple does not stand in Jerusalem. However, there is a spiritual essence to this law and these laws that we have read. I'm asking you to open your heart and begin to open your eyes to those who, in normal circumstances, if we're, we're in the land of Israel with a temple and a Shiach and a Sanhedrin, then it would be required for you to be kind to a sojourner. So if you find non-Jew who takes upon themselves the yoke of heaven and rejects idolatry and shatuf, and they take upon them the Sheva Mitzvot, consider them part of the community and be kind. Now the Torah also commends the Jews in a number of mitzvahs, ensuring the ger toshav a degree of equanimity in civil and monetary laws. These mitzvahs also guarantee specific protection for the earned wages of a ger toshav. There is also an obligation for the Jews to establish courts to adjudicate disputes between a ger toshav according to their Noahide laws. From the Jewish perspective, the, Jewish, the ger toshav, since he does not worship idols, is not subject to the laws based upon concerns for idolatry. For example, we do not accept an oath from a, a regular uh, non-Jew because he will likely swear that oath in the name of a false deity. However, we may accept an oath from a ger toshav, the wine of, idolater, of, of idolaters, because it is the religious significance to them and is prohibited for both benefit of consumption. However, the wine of a ger toshav is only prohibited for consumption it should be noted that there are few other instances in Torah law related to idolatry in which a ger toshav is regularly different, regarded differently than an idolater. In every other aspect, though, the ger toshav is treated like an idolater in a number of instances in which we may have thought otherwise. The sources may certain to reinforce this point. Number one, Jews may uh, lend to a ger toshav on interest. A Jew who must sell himself in servitude may only sell himself to another Jew or a convert. He may not serve a ger tosha. And there are obvious reasons why. The Shemitah year does not cancel the debts of a ger tosha. 
if a Jew sells his indentured servant to a Gertoshav, the Jew is forced to buy him back, even if it's at an exorbitant price, and grant him his freedom. Biblically, a Gertoshav is like a non-Jew with regard to the laws of Tzeras. He does not become impure. However, there are a number of rabbinic decrees creating exceptions for the Gertoshav. A Gertoshav may not partake of Passover sacrifice. Jews may not accept the funds from a Gertoshav for the, for the rebuilding or upkeep of the temple complex. Jews have no commandment to correct or rebuke a Gertoshav, according to the Talmud of Bodhisattva 64b. Records of three ways of dispute on how a, a Gentile becomes a Gertoshav. Now, Rabbi Meir, a Gertoshav, is a non-Jew who has before three Torah scholars accepted upon himself to not worship idols. The Chachamim states, the majority of the sages, uh, a Ger Toshav is a non-Jew who before three Torah scholars accepts upon himself the observance of the Sheva Mitzvot, or the seven Noahide categories. The Acherim, other sages, uh, the, the Ger Toshav is a non-Jew who has accepted all the commandments of the Torah, save one prohibits prohibitation of eating uh, novellos or eating meat that is corrupt, meat that has not been properly slaughtered, according to Torah law. Uh, multiple opinions may be acceptable in matters of history or homiletics, yet we can only accept a single idea as binding in matters of practice. One of the many rules for deciding halakha practice is that the opinion of the majority is decisive. The chachamim, being the majority, is therefore the halakha, the practice. As expected, all later scholars decide the halakha and the practice in accordance with the Chachamim. Agir Toshav is a non-Jew who is accepted before three scholars the observance of the Shabbos or Sheba Mitzvot or the seven mitzvahs and categories. One scholar, however, Rashi, is inconsistent in his definition of Agir Toshav. In a number of places, Rashi appears to define Agir Toshav using Rabbi Meir's criteria. Strangely, though, Rashi rules like the Chachamin in Avodah Zohar 24b. What then does Rashi actually hold? Scholars have taken the position that Rashi must hold like the Chachamin. After all, the idea that Rashi would deviate from the basic tenets of Talmudic interpretation is unthinkable. Now, the difficulty lies in the explaining the occasion in which Rashi appears to follow around Rabbi Meir. Many great scholars have tried to uh, unravel Rashi, yet no single approach has succeeded. The most famous explanation of Rashi is that of Be'er Sheva. He explains that Avodah Zara 64b is part of a larger Talmudic conversation about when Jews are obligated to support a non-Jew who lives among them within Israel. According to the Be'er Sheva, Rashi agrees with the Chochamim only with regard to providing support to the Gertosha. However, the Beershev explains that Rashi follows Rabbi Meir's opinion for all other matters affecting the Gertosha. The Beershev's explanation works well for many instances where Rashi appears to espouse Rabbi Meir. However, it is contradicted by Rashi's comments, for example, in Arachin 29a. Their Rashi seems to apply Rabbi Meir's criteria even for the sake of defining a Ger Toshav for communal support. Maimonides, the Arban Torim, and the Shulchan Arut all record the position of the Chochamin as conclusive. To become a Ger Toshav, a non-Jew must accept the seven laws that were given to him from Moshe, from God to Moshe, before based in a tribunal of three qualified scholars. However, there is a ruling today that states that it's not necessarily required to have a base din of Torah scholars, i.e. Jewish Torah scholars. It could be a mixture of pious non-Jews or a panel of non-Jews. It can even be made as a self-declaration to oneself because we know not all non-Jews who consider themselves Noahides have the ability to go before a base din or go before a court. Now, we are very fortunate to live in a time in which the, the Internet gives us some level of connection to the heartland of Israel and to Orthodox rabbis all around the world. 
World Noahide Center on a regular basis does a Zoom sort of based in so people can call into Zoom and make their declaration. You might want to consider that. Look them up on called World Noahide Center. If you have any more questions, please send me a text and let's chat. Hope you'll enjoy your time of study and we'll see you in next class.